Welcome to the July 2022 Textual Study of the Bible and Beyond Discussions. I'm your host tonight, Hilary Barner, and our presenter this evening is Dr. Shirley Paulson. Tonight, we're talking about abortion and the dialogue of the Savior. In the context of our national discussion about abortion, it could be a helpful idea to step back and consider the way people wrestled with similar questions in antiquity. Of course, the medical supports we have today weren't there then, but the issues were social, moral, and life-threatening just as they are today. I want to remind you of our bonus again tonight. We will continue with our extra 20 minutes of spiritual reflection transitioning from head to heart, led by Reverend Karen Hagen. Feel free to leave or stay on with us when the program is finished. And before we turn it over to Shirley, I'd like to mention that Early Christian Texts encourages and is grateful for an ongoing pledge of support via Patreon at any regular amount. Right now, Patreon supporters also have private access to the series of short video conversations with the editor of Shirley's book, Illuminating the Secret Revelation of John. To make a monthly pledge for early Christian texts and gain access to this series, please go to patreon.com slash Bible and beyond. Check the chat box here or the website for details. Thank you so much. And now here's Shirley. Well, great. Hi, everybody. It's so much fun to get together again and explore. Um, some of you may have noticed that we have a, a guest that we haven't seen before, and I want to just quickly introduce you to her. If you can see on your screen, you can see Chris there with a pink sweater on. That's Dr. Christine Shea, and she has um, been willing to come and join us tonight because she's a, a scholar of classics, and I think her, her knowledge of antiquity will provide a most wonderful foundation for the rest of our discussion tonight. Um, she's a professor at Ball State University and specifically an expert in ancient Greek and Roman culture. Much of her writing has been associated with the West Star Institute, such as her work on uh, these books, Acts and Christian Beginnings, The Acts of Jesus and The Five Gospels. Chris has been working closely with West Star far longer than I have but I've come to know her through our mutual work, recent mutual work at Westar. And I think you'll appreciate what she has to tell us. So first of all, welcome to Chris before I get into everything. Hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Shirley. You're such a wonderful addition to Westar. <laughs> uh, so uh, I thought I might just take 10 minutes or so just to talk in general about uh, abortion, et cetera, in antiquity. So. Uh, always understanding that there are limitations involved in discussing anything connected with pagan antiquity. And there's always the question of covering so many years. Tonight, I'm going to talk about things from the 5th century BCE to the 5th century CE. And so many different cultures. I'll drag in the uh, Egyptians, the Etruscans, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, the fact that for some cultures, uh, we can't read their languages, the Etruscans, this mysterious culture to the north of the Romans who make so many contributions even to our own lives, their language we only understand imperfectly. On the other hand, we understand the Persians' language, which is an Indo-European language, but we don't have very many texts from the ancient Persians, so we have to guess uh, what their attitudes would be about things. Uh, those are limitations. Uh, in terms of the kinds of texts we have that would have some relevance, we have quite a body of medical texts. Yes. The ones that are ascribed to Hippocrates, who is the semi-legendary doctor who is supposed to have lived around the time of Socrates, that is in the fifth century BCE. Uh, it's a huge conglomeration of uh, things of various dates, hard to date them. Uh, also, we have about 15% of all of the Greek that remains to us is ascribed to the Roman era Dr. Galen, uh, who lived from 129 to 216 
CE. And of course, in that collection, there's also a whole bunch of things that are thrown together. Who knows where they come from? Uh, so uh, that's the kind of text we have on the medical side. Then also, of course, we have literary texts. In other words, uh, people want to talk about uh, women and men and their relationships, uh, birth, death, etc. But literary texts have their own limitations. So, for example, when Xenophon, the 5th century Athenian, describes Isomachus as talking about his perfect wife and saying that she is seeing, hearing, saying as little as possible, is that a reflection of how women really behave in ancient Athens? Or is it uh, some sort of literary bid to teach women to behave better than they do. Uh, so literary texts are problematic in a different direction. Uh, some of the problems in general with ancient uh, sources are, of course, they are for the most part authored by elite men. And in terms of women's medicine, for example, uh, the usual birthing is probably in the hands of midwives who don't write or don't write much. Uh, we see some evidence of midwife knowledge in what the doctors, in quotes, of the Hippocratic Corpus report, uh, but we don't have something like a midwife's guide, which would be useful. So in terms of male doctors, presumably they're called in in special circumstances in terms of birthing, that is, uh, especially difficult births or perhaps births of the upper classes. So there would be a whole set of information we wouldn't have much uh, knowledge of. Also, too, of course, uh, doctors, male doctors, often get their training as Galen is supposed to have gotten his in the gladiatorial schools or in combat. Oh. And so much of what's written in the medical text is dealing with wounds, particularly war wounds, so, for example, in the Hippocratic Corpus, there's only about 29% of the, uh, let's say, cases that are discussed involve women. Okay, so there's a shortage of information there, too. Another problem is uh, knowledge. The ancients uh, do not favor empirical knowledge. They like ratiocination, speculation. In other words, even when they could experiment, or even when an experiment would be reasonably easy to set up, they tend not to do it. And they tend to favor the kind of thinking that is in some ways a magical a, a elegance. They like elegant explanations. <laughs> uh, so do we. So, for example, we clung to the vision of the atom as being a miniature solar system much longer than we should have because it's so elegant. The biggest thing is the smallest thing. Uh, but uh, so, for example, in terms of medicine, the ancients don't practice dissection. And that means that their knowledge of human anatomy is really screwy. So in terms of women, for example, the Greeks have inherited, perhaps from the Egyptians, the idea that the uterus wanders through the body. Mm. and attaches itself to other organs. And when it attaches itself to other organs, it causes problems uh, for women. And this explains, uh, for example, uh, why women are, uh, have, are depressed or uh, why uh, women have certain kinds of uh, psychological ailments or why, in fact, in contrast to men, uh, women are uh, warm and wet and uh, porous, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, they don't completely understand the mechanisms. So two of the hip, uh, doctors of the Hippocratic Corpus, for example, talk about a seven-day and a six-day abortion mm. and describe the fetus as having arms and legs. So, uh, <laughs> what's that? Uh, so, uh, in general, for example, in terms of 
uh, uh, birth, etc., uh, they have some uh, ideas which uh, cause problems and the consequences of which still linger, we could argue, uh, to this day. Uh, they uh, use the word contraception, miscarriage, a nine-month abortion, mm -hmm. a spontaneous abortion, and stillbirth are all called by the same word in different texts. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes, it can become impossible to discuss, to figure out what they're talking about uh, often. Uh, so uh, these are problems with their uh, science. Also, they don't have the sociological interest we have. So, for example, you can look online anytime you want and find out what percentage of the American public chews gum, what percentage of the American public uh, thinks dogs are better than cats, what percentage. And, but the ancients simply aren't interested in that kind of data. And so often they're uh, making magical guesses or elegant guesses at something where we would study it sociologically. So, for example, the ancients say that menstruation uh, comes on at age 14. Well, 14 is two times the magic number seven. So 14, they've pulled that number out of their asses, you know, really, uh, whereas obviously we would study that much more uh, thoroughly. Okay. In terms of uh, biases connected with uh, ancient life, uh, much of what's happening in terms of babies and birthing is connected with who, whose birth is it? Hmm. Who, to whom does the baby belong? Who is the victim in an abortion? And uh, for a long time, of course, it's imagined in many cultures that the family has an interest in the produce, the product of a wife, particularly when one remembers that in patriarchal societies, a wife is a stranger in the family, an outsider, in some ways, an interloper. And so the wife's fertility belongs to the family. So it's the family which is offended if the wife interferes with a birth, for example, or the husband, the curios, the uh, household chief, the paterfamilias to the Romans, is the one who has been, is the victim of an abortion. It's only in Roman times in the early empire that that starts to shift. So under the emperor Augustus, it becomes the state, which is the victim in an abortion. Hmm. The state was deprived of a person. Uh, so uh, that's another issue. Uh, the other thing that happens, of course, too, is that uh, if a wife has an abortion, it's often assumed that women are anxious to have abortions. There is talk about that. Because... It is believed that uh, women are afraid to give birth. And considering the circumstances in which women do give birth in antiquity, it wouldn't be unreasonable to be afraid. Uh, so we have, for example, a Roman example of a girl uh, dead at age 20 who had already had six children, for example. Uh, so, and that may be uh, an issue. Of course, adultery might be an issue as well. But some uh, else that is happening is if a woman carries a baby to term, the husband, the father, or the family can choose the gender of the baby <laughs> to survive. <laughs> you can expose a girl child and keep a boy child. Tell us what expose means. What do you mean by expose? Expose infanticide, the ancients, there is not an ancient voice raised against infanticide. There's hardly an ancient voice raised against it. So it's a regular practice. So exposing means that the child dies, you put it out to die. The child is put out to die, but exposure is complicated business because, for example, in Rome, there's a particular place where you leave healthy babies that you don't want. And 
often those babies are girls, not only because more girls are born than boys, and you're trying to keep the genders even, but also because it's been estimated that the dowry of a girl child can cost a family between five and 20% of its resources. So money goes out of the family if a girl is born. Money comes into a family if a boy is born. And poverty is always given as a reason for abortion. There's never a voice raised against abortion because you cannot afford a baby. So, uh, so you can expose a baby in a particular place and everybody knows what that place is. And if you want a baby, you can come to that place and take a baby. Now, how this works, it's hard for us to say. And what the ancients say about it, it's hard to get at. So sometimes it's biases of, for example, uh, later Christians reporting things. So it was always reported of the Spartans that they had an abyss where they threw in babies that they didn't want that were defective in some ways. These are harsh cultures. You can't imagine a boy child surviving who is crippled. So, uh, but when we've excavated the place that we think is the abyss, we don't find particularly babies there at all. We find mostly adults. And what babies are there don't appear to be defective. Uh, so, uh, it's hard to say what's going on. In early modern cultures that practiced the same kind of thing, it, it's often that a village person announces, I don't want this baby anymore. I'm leaving it for the wild animals to eat. And then leave it in the, I'm leaving it in the forest right over here on this rock. I'm leaving it for the wild animals. And then that person retreats. Then if somebody wants that baby, they can come and get it. And you can never claim that baby again because you said you were leaving it for the wild animals. And so it's hard to say. Obviously, tales like that are behind Oedipus, the Oedipus story, or Snow White as far as that goes. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's hard to say what's going on. But infanticide, there's hardly a voice spoken against it. Abortion in some places might be wrong because abortion doesn't let the father save a boy child or because a woman is killing a male may also have been an issue. Hard to say. Okay. Wow. So. Go, go ahead. Yeah, let's, we probably we should summarize this because we need to get into the dialogue of the Savior, but this is just uh, uh, mind-blowing here. So go ahead and tell us. Um, well, let me tell you one case, perhaps, that might sum up uh, a lot of things. This is reported in the a Hippocratic corpus in an, an issue called On the Nature of the Child. And uh, in this case, the head of a household who happens to be a woman, who is the friend of the doctor who is reporting it, okay, has a slave who is a singer. And the woman loans the singer out as an entertainer and makes money thereby. And she, the singer thinks she's pregnant. And the woman comes to the doctor and says, what should we do to abort the baby? And the doctor says, have her leap up and down, et cetera, various things uh, to abort the baby. But the issue in there is that, first of all, nobody questions whether it's the right of the head of the household to get rid of the baby of somebody in the household, just as we would say, it doesn't matter how sad your dog is that you're selling her puppies. Those puppies are yours, and you can do what you want with them. Mm. Also, too, of course, it's the issue of economics. The woman is more valuable as a wage earner and than as a mother. And so, for the sake of economics, it's okay to abort the baby. Of course, another issue is the whole question of when is a baby human? Yeah. So one of the treatises attributed to the Roman era, Dr. Galen, is called, What is the thing that lives in the womb? What is it? Yeah. And that's a whole issue as well. 
And that's an issue that we could say, I'll just say, might apply to early Christianity too. In village Greece in 1920, it was thought that babies were not human until they were baptized. And so between the time a baby was born and the time it was baptized, not only was it not human, it might even be a demon because of original sin, et cetera. So it was okay to kill that baby if it meant that you were uh, for saving your family's resources or if there was some defect in the baby. So uh, I just uh, mentioned just a little a summary of things. So, uh, so. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the, the point is that there was such a thing as the concept of abortion back then. There was such a thing as a debate about the whole thing. And the women were probably the least to be consulted as to what was going on. And I think you raised a really important point for us that um, transitions us to the dialogue of the savior with the question of um, what is a human? And, and when is a human a human? Because I think that's a, a major um, part of the story that's going on in many of the extra canonical texts, and particularly the um, dialogue of the Savior. So let me just give a little bit of a background of dialogue of the Savior, and then we're going to stop and have a little uh, catching and make sure people are with us on the same page on this. So I just want to say that um, Although the dialogue of the Savior is called a dialogue, it's really only part of the, um, the text because it begins with actually a lecture from Jesus. And in that beginning lecture of Jesus, Jesus is explaining a bit about overcoming the power of darkness to understand the inner life. So even right there in this little this, um, concept of Jesus and his preaching, you see there's a question of what is life? What does it mean? And he's using the um, analogy of the lamp, which you may be familiar with in biblical terms, uh, where like in Luke, we hear your eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. If it's not healthy, your body is full of darkness. So in the um, dialogue part of the dialogue of the Savior, we have three of his disciples asking questions about life and about the meaning of life and what is life and so forth. So just to sort of get the conversation going a little bit, I want to take a kind of a quick survey. And Hillary, you may help me with this. I'd like you to guess who the three disciples would be that Jesus is talking to about life. <laughs> just um, maybe you can throw it up in the chat real quick. Um, I'll give you about 10 seconds to write down three disciples that you think Jesus might be talking to in this ancient text. We got Peter. Uh, Mary, Thomas, Mary, Peter, James, and John. Um, let me scroll up here a little. John, Peter, and Matthew. Mary, Matthew, Judas, and Thomas. Mary Magdalene, Matthew, Judas, and Mary. Peter, James, and John. That's what we've got so far. Very good. Then some people know this text. That tells that I can tell from that. That's excellent. All right. So it's true. One of them is Matthew, and Judas, not Iscariot is another one. And this is the Judas who um, might be taught, thought of as Judas Thomas of the twin. And if you didn't know that Jesus had a twin brother, that's another whole lecture someday. <laughs> and the third one is Mary. Of course, the wonderful thing about these ancient texts is we don't know which Mary. <laughs> it just says Mary. It could be Mary Magdalene. In fact, my opinion is it probably is, but we can't say for sure. So there's this dialogue of Jesus with these disciples, Matthew, Thomas, and Mary. What are they talking about? And again, mostly they're talking about the meaning of life as they struggle to understand a spiritual meaning of it, which is what Jesus is talking about. And how does this relate to abortion? Well, it never, this text never mentions the word abortion, but since the subject is about the origin and meaning of life, as well as the female body, I think we can glean some important thoughts about abortion from this discussion. So, um, Already in this, um, in this part of the text, the, um, there's a connection, I think, between the ideas of abortion and what we see, um, you know, the way they're thinking of uh, the issues like the, that Chris has been talking about. Today, for example, we see that there are different attitudes from Catholics and evangelicals and progressives and Jews and Muslims and people who are not religious at all. So there are always lots of differences of, of thoughts about um, life and what, what is going on. And we're going to start with one passage 
um, from this dialogue of the Savior, and then I'm going to stop and ask you your thoughts about things. So, uh, so Mary said, Master, look, while I wear a body, where do my tears come from? Where does my laughter come from? The master said, the body weeps because of its works and what remains to be done. The mind laughs because of the fruits of the spirit. Okay, I want to read that once again, because there's a lot to this. And I want you to think about this. So Mary said, master, look, while I wear a body, where do my tears come from? Where does my laughter come from? The master said, the body weeps because of its works and what remains to be done. The mind laughs because of the fruits of the spirit. Okay, so now my question is, um, what do you make of this? What, what does this say to you in terms of um, what Jesus is teaching about life? And how do you interpret that? Just get some questions, some thoughts about this. And to get you started, I'll just get you going with some ideas here. I think the master doesn't seem to differentiate between her female body and a male body here in terms of what bodies are doing. And a body seems to be an expression of thought. For example, the weeping and the laughing. And it, it's a body that's doing those things. We've got a raised hand, Shirley. Maureen, go ahead. Hey, Maureen. Well, that's what I was going to say. I, mind blown at that first phrase, while I wear a body, because <laughs> it sounds like her eye is not a body. Yeah. So that's, wow. <laughs> Good for you. Yes, wow is right. So what is making the body weep then? And what's making the body laugh? Well, it sort of sounds to me like um, the idea of wearing a body almost sounds like the body is a voluntary choice, perhaps a temporary one. We've got Joy's raised her hand too. Okay, good, Joy. Well, I'm noticing in the translation I was reading, I'm, I didn't know if the one you had on the screen was the same, but in Myers, it's the body that weeps and the mind that laughs. Oh. And that the body is weeping because of its works. And I'm thinking it's contrasting physical things versus spiritual things because the mind laughs because of the fruits of the spirit. So one is burdened down with the physical nature while the other is laughing and joyful because of the spiritual nature. That's an interesting way of looking at that too. All right, I'm, and then I'm going to read one more, then we'll stop and sort of bring all these things together a little bit here. I'm going to try to share my screen again so you can see this. Judas said to Matthew, we want to understand what sort of garments we are to be clothed with when we leave the corruption of the flesh. The master said, the rulers and the administrators, that means the, you know, the Romans basically, who were the enemies of the people, have garments that are given only for a while and do not last. But you, as children of truth, are not to clothe yourselves with these garments that last only for a while. Rather, I say to you, you will be blessed when you strip off your clothing, for it is no great thing to lay aside what is external. All right, so some thoughts about that. I want other people to have a chance to speak up, but it sounds very similar to putting off the corruptible man and putting on the incorruptible. <clears throat> I, I think Jesus is meaning that more than um, metaphorically too, in a way. I mean, he's not just sort of talking about a poem, even though poems are important, but <laughs> there's some way of thinking about the meaning of life here. Like thinking of the body in terms of flesh is represented as clothing that we can put off or on. How do you put off and on your flesh? Well, he's also equating it to the rulers who were oppressing them and um, explaining that the disciples can choose their clothing and that the, um, the uh, rulers are having a kind of clothing that is oppressive. So again, I think we're, we're, we're thinking in terms of, do we have 
are they talking about a kind of life that is not confined to the fleshly world? Is it real or is it, is it um, wishful thinking? Is it, um, what's Jesus talking about? And I think that this is what's distinguishing Jesus from the Greco-Roman world, world that Chris has been talking about. So let me just pause here now. Let's just bring in Chris's conversation with us and talk together about, okay, how do you think that Jesus was, what was he teaching here? What was his point in, in the context of what Chris has been telling us about in terms of um, attitudes for, toward bodies, toward women, toward babies, toward life? I'll tell you what, before we then, let's go back to Chris's um, sharing with us. We have Chris uh, with her hand up. Then great. Go ahead, Chris. I might just say here that uh, I'll just bring an example in that might help. Uh, of course, uh, natural mummification in the Sahara, uh, like, for example, the naturally mummified woman who's on exhibit, the Field Museum in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, what does that, uh, if you stumbled upon such a person in the desert, what would you think had mm -hmm. happened there? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, we have an example of what people do think. We have a letter from a diplomat, in an Egyptian diplomat who was assigned to Rome. And he writes back, I feel that I am getting old and death is near. Please don't let me die here where bodies uh, rot. Let me come back to sacred Egypt so I can find eternal life. So in terms of a kind of uh, reality, there may be in what is really a desert religion, uh, a notion that the Romans are in a place where bodies are rot. Uh, but uh, for us, the body is just clothing, like finding a naturally mummified body. I just mentioned it. Uh, so, Thank you. Yeah, interesting. I just think it's really helpful for us to think broadly about what a body means and about um, how you identify life. Is it is it going on in a body that's born at a certain time and that dies at a certain time? Because I think what's going on with the Jesus that is teaching here is he's, he's trying to explain what immortality is about. And, and if there's an immortality then, then, and there's no death, then what does birth mean? I mean, immortality can't exist without, with a birth process. All right, then hang on to this, and we're going to move on to another passage, and we'll see if we can, this will help us a little bit more also. Judas said, when we pray, how should we pray? The master said, pray in the place where there is no woman. Matthew says, he tells us, pray in the place where there's no woman, which means destroy the works of the female, not because there is another form of birth, but because they should stop giving birth. <laughs> Did you know this was going on in this text? <laughs> All right. What is Jesus getting at here? Pray in the place where there's no woman. Well, I'm sure you can imagine that if you are struggling scholars have also been struggling over this. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, I want you to know too, while you're thinking about this, that um, I did a podcast interview with Anna Quickla on the list of my podcasts in the early Christian text. If you want to hear her uh, discussion about this one passage, that's in, um, you could just look up Anna Quickla in my um, uh, podcast. But <clears throat> I, I think there's still enough here that what we've been talking about in terms of immortality and about life in, or in matter or not in matter, we can think about what does this mean about praying in the place where there's no woman? What does a woman mean? And Chris gave us a very helpful um, background in understanding woman then. Pray in the place where there is no birth process? That's a very good way to think about woman. Play in the place where there is no 
woman, no birth process. Now, what's wrong with the birth process? Joy, go ahead. I think if you read a little bit before this passage, the master says he's explaining whether things are heavenly or earthly. And he says that the father established the word world for himself and he left many things to the mother of all. And I think that he's contrasting the mother of all, who is a divine part of the creation with the works of the female as the um, human procreation thing. So I really don't think we're talking about body as much as we're thinking still again, again, about a physical being versus the divine beings. Yeah. Thank you, Joy. Yeah. And, you know, and then um, I have my, my own notes here that another form of birth could mean that it, there's, there, um, there is another form of birth um, so that they should stop the kind of birth that produces mortality. It's possible that Matthew's referring to the kind of birth that Jesus had in mind, remember, in the Gospel of John, where he spoke to Nicodemus. You remember the Pharisee who came to him by night asking about eternal life? And jo Jesus told him to be born of the spirit, not of the flesh. <laughs> So I see some more hands here. So Margie, go ahead. Yeah, I got two raised hands. Great. Okay, Margie. Well, I'm, I think maybe this is off, but I was just thinking in terms of the messiness of birth. <clears throat> when you consider that um, to touch anybody who was dead made you unclean, and women during their menstruation period had to hide away somewhere, <clears throat> that it could be kind of a reference to that as well, to just that whole uncleanness. Um, that they considered the whole female anatomy and process to be, um, you know, so maybe it's a reference to purity as opposed to what might be considered impure. Very helpful, yeah. And Sarah, what's on your mind? You need to unmute first. And it's just uh, teasing in my memory from the Gospel of Thomas, where he's telling Mary Magdalene that she has to become male. I don't have anything deep to go on from there, but 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 it does sound so so similar that I think when we talked about it months ago, it wasn't really so much the physiological um, male female, but other characteristics that, that were under discussion. And you're making a really good point, I think, Sarah, because remember in the Gospel of Thomas, we saw a, a lot of connection with Genesis, uh, where Genesis is telling us that God made it male and female. And, and so um, there's that male-female um, uh, spectrum that we're hearing from the Greco-Roman culture is not in this um, Jewish picture in Genesis. It's, it's a um, God has made male and female one and the same. So you're right. I think there's a this is a, a interesting pushback against the cultural milieu that we've been talking about in terms of what a female means in a family, and 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 what the female means in terms of becoming fully human, fully uh, God's child, God's offspring. Surely Karen has her mic open. I don't know if she wanted to speak or not. <laughs> I'm waiting. Um, yeah, I, I was just going, I was thinking the very, uh, along the very same lines that what comes up to me, and it may be my modern ears, <laughs> is that it's not about being female or male. It's about being human. And that does resonate with uh, God made humankind in our image. We made them male and female. Um, yeah, so a sense of going to a place to pray in our humanity, in the fullness of our humanity, our divinity. That's what I was thinking. That's very interesting. All right, so let me take you to another um, wonderful passage here. So Mary said, will they, the works of the female, never be destroyed? The master said, 
you know they will perish once again, and the works of the female here will be destroyed as well. Judas said to Matthew, the works of the female will, be, will perish. Then the rulers will call upon their realm, and we shall be ready for them. Oh, I'm glad you're puzzled too. All right, so Mary said, will they never be destroyed? Master says, you know they will perish once again. And the works of the female here will be destroyed as well. Jesus says, the works of the female will perish. Then the rulers will call upon their realm and we shall be ready for them. So where, where do we think the rulers are? What realm are they talking about? First of all, we know that Jesus already said in one of the other passages that the rulers put on the perishable life, right? So the, um, the, the realm that the rulers are talking about are the ones that are the mortal. And, the, and so those are perishable. And so it appears to be, to me anyway, that um, the master is teaching them that the works of the female, as long as they're thought of to be mortal, will continue to perish. It doesn't matter whether you have an abortion or whether you, or however you die, is going to perish. And in, and, but in the case of immortality, you can't get born into matter. I guess um, this is also kind of reminding me, the, um, and I'll bring this up here too, just I didn't, I don't think I copied this. In the Gospel of Luke, um, where Jesus is walking toward Calvary with the cross, the women are lamenting him. And he stops to tell them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are surely coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never, uh, never nursed. Again, that's in the canonical writings. And then also here we have the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, when you see one who was not born of woman, fall on your faces and worship. That is your father. So these are strange sounding things because we don't tend to talk like this. But it just seems to me that he's, he's um, distinguishing the life that's mortal, where you'll always have to deal with abortion questions, because you don't know whose right it is for someone to be born, versus the immortality where male and female are one, and um, the, the birthing process is not the identification of a human. It's, it's a... I, I mean, the perfect human, I guess I should say. <laughs> Sarah has her hand up. Great, Sarah, go ahead. Th that middle paragraph there where the master said, you know, they will perish again. Yeah. And then the works of the female here will be, it almost sounds like he's talking about something that went on before our present experience and then talking about our present experience. Oh, that's interesting. Um, as, as though in the prior life that of which we remember nothing ourselves, there must there may have been some some of these questions may have <laughs> arisen there too. Well, that's an interesting way to think about it too. Yes, and the, and we shall be ready for them. <laughs> what do you make of that? We shall be ready for them. I don't know. <laughs> 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 you can tell them I'm trying do. to turn my wheels here and they're squeaking. <laughs> I think you can probably see we're all in the same boat together on this. Yeah. But it's worth pondering, isn't it? So it's we, we shall be ready for the rulers, I guess, to, to, to deal with the rulers. Once we don't have this female business anymore, male and female. Well, the, the females that, that produce... A, um, abortion type people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it looks like uh, Janice has her hand up too. Well, I'm wondering what the word works, because the word works is in here three times, the works of the female, what, what that word really is, because I don't, I mean, what are works? That's just so strange. It's such a strange way of saying it, though. Like we might say workings, but I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't sit right with me. I just, it's very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> Joy, go ahead. Put your hand up. Well, one of the other translations. Daddy, you, can you come help me? I don't. I've lost the word acts. Okay. Instead of works. Okay, that's helpful. And that seems to be easier to read to me. Yeah, it's a very good point. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Does that help you, Janice? Yeah. Okay. So the acts of the female. So that makes me think more of like, just what is the female life like? What is, what do women do? What, what, what are they involved in? So that's different. Um, hmm. Works of the female parish. Well, I can go, you know, go back to that, that passage of, in John, I got the gospel of John where Jesus is telling Nicodemus, the works of your mother, meaning being born of out of the womb of your fleshly mother, is where your mortality is, and you have to be born again. Right. Born of the spirit. And so, of course, uh -huh. if what do you mean? You're not making any sense. I can't do that. And so, but Jesus said, well, then you're going to have to in order to know what your life is. So I, I think that we're um, contrasting to kind of Okay. Picture this says who's born of what? And if you're born of the kind that you have to get born again in, that's the one that um, can get aborted and killed. Yeah. And that would be the works of the female. Yeah. And I don't think Jesus is opposed to female. He's just talking about the birthing process, I think. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Chris has her hand up. Oh, good. Come back, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I might just uh, I might just add a couple of things. Uh, in some ancient cultures, uh, the uh, baby is put in the jar, which is what a uterus is, by the father, and the mother has nothing to do with it. The mother is a sack. <laughs> and in that sense, when the baby is born, in, in other words, the uterus is like a planet wow. that the baby was inserted into. And then the baby is born in trouble and strife and blood. OK, wow. and that's the female contribution. And uh, in some cultures, that's the thought. The other thing that happens in ancient cultures, the ancients think that babies have motive force, that babies are sentient mm. and that they decide when to be born and that they push themselves out. And male babies have more force than female babies, mm. too. So in that sense, we could think of this planet as being a place we were stuck on, like being put in a uterus. Wow. It's a place that women are places. Yeah. And, and so this planet is a female place. It's defective. It's yeah. the, the uh, like Gnostic, what, what we call Gnostic ideas of this planet as being uh, evil and defective, uh, uh, etc. I just yes. mentioned it. Those ideas are out there. So anyway, very helpful. I I had not realized the, the about the idea of the scent of the um the will of a baby to decide when to come. Um, that's very interesting to think about. So I see DGA DJA's iPad. Go ahead, whoever you are. <laughs> um, I was going to say that um, some of the cultures, like the Athenians, uh, believe that the woman was basically like soil and the man sowed his seed and it into the soil. And that's all she was, was something to uh, like a, like a seed to, to where the seed will take place and grow. She had nothing to do with the actual creation of, of the baby. It was all the man, you know, and, I, I thought of that. And then also when I think of the uh, works of the women, what about the works of the flesh? That's what Paul, I think, used a lot of. Instead of calling it, uh, you know, women or, you know, like he, he was talking about the flesh. And I feel like what they're talking about here is um, 
when they're talking about the works of the woman is like more like the works of the flesh and to, uh, separate that from, you know, that's a mortal sense of being. It's, the, um, it's finite. It's not going to last versus the immortal concept. And, and where does your real life come from? It doesn't come from the flesh. You have to know that. Otherwise, you're stuck in this situation or stuck with the Romans. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Very helpful insights, everybody. I see we, I, we, Maureen, I think we have time for one more comment. If you're the last one, let's hear what you're thinking. Well, I was thinking of the, the works of the woman. For me as a writer, my works are what I produce. Mm -hmm. So to me, I'm seeing the works of the woman are the baby she makes. Yeah. So, and then the whole underlying thing seems to be, what are you calling your identity? And I'm taken back to Nicodemus because I just love him where Jesus says, you've got to be born from above. You've got to have your identity from not from in and out of your mother's womb one or two or three times, you know? So <laughs> it just seems like the questions here. And again, the language is so interesting, but it's how are you identifying yourself? And if you're going to live out your life, we'll be ready to face the rulers of the realm when we're being our immortal selves, I guess, our non-physical, when we're not the fruits of the feminine, the female body. Yeah, yeah. Which is a limited sense of things, and it's not from above. So anyway, but this is just fascinating. Well, it really is. And I, I, I hate to bring this to a close, but I hope that at least we have stirred the pot. <laughs> we have some more things to think about. Um, I might just try to summarize where I think we've been today. I think I so appreciate Chris coming tonight to help us to get some context of what, 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 where this was taking place and why were people thinking this way? And was Jesus message a pushback against what Chris was talking about? Or was it some new revolutionary thought? Or was it fitting right in? You know, I think it's helpful for us to think about um, what Jesus is teaching in relation to the larger world in, in which this was all happening. And I think, I mean, I just feel like it's this does fit along with his teaching of Nicodemus. There's got to be another way to think about life. I'm challenging to to do that by thinking of the beginning, not just death, not just finding immortality after it's all over, but but where are you coming from? And what makes you think you come from that direction? And I love the way Chris has helped us think about um, what a baby means and what the woman's body means and and um, why we can think about immortality in such a different way. So my hope is that you'll keep on reading the dialogue of the savior <laughs> and, and noodle over this with your friends and, and, and yourself and keep on sharing these. I think this is an um, important part of the whole picture. We'll probably spend some more time on the dialogue of the savior some other time, but this was just an introduction to some fascinating uh, ideas, things that are there. Okay, so Hillary, you wanna wrap us up here? Okay, thank you everybody for your participation. This was the July 2022 textual study on the Bible and beyond discussions on abortion and the dialogue of the Savior led by Dr. Shirley Paulson. Once a month from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern time on Monday nights, we provide a discussion of one of the early Christian texts. One of the scholars leads these sessions, sharing a well-framed overview of the particular text and allowing participants time to ask questions and share their insights. I'd like to announce what's happening next month. Hal Tossig will be back, but please note we're meeting on the third Monday, not the fourth Monday in August, on August 15th at the regular time. Our topic will be Sophia, Wisdom, Jesus, God, in the first three centuries of the Common Era. The team at Early Christian Texts relies on your donations to be able to produce these textual studies. There are several extra bonuses for Patreon members, now including the new video series, Spotlight on the Secret Revelation of John. If you haven't become a member yet, Go to patreon.com slash Bible and beyond to make a pledge. PayPal or a check is also an option if you prefer. Check the website earlychristiantext.com for details. Thank you all so much. <laughs>